where we're dealing with conflict areas and humanitarian crises, there are so many issues around communications and linguists. And Those scanlation sites, they host unlicensed and amateur translations of webcomics from Korea and other countries. This covers translation, interpreting, language training, and international logistics. And welcome to Slater Pod 85. Hello from Zurich. Hi, Florian from London. 85. We're 15 away from 100. Getting there. The century. Mm. What are we going to do for the century? Maybe an in person pod. <laughs> just, just to add to the logistical. Uh, challenge that is recording a weekly podcast. Today we have Rebecca Petrus, spokesperson of Red Tea, a topic that's uh, very much in the news currently. We'll talk to, Pet, uh, to Rebecca about the situation of interpreters uh, in conflict zones and of course particularly what's going on in Afghanistan. So uh, Red Tea is, is a nonprofit uh, founded by Maya Hess and uh, we have Rebecca Petrus, uh, the spokesperson, on in just 10 to 15 minutes, we want to keep the opening brief and really uh, you know, give that uh, topic the, the, the attention it deserves. So uh, looking forward to talking to Rebecca. And uh, for those who haven't registered, please register for SlaterCon Remote. The agenda is complete. It's happening next week in the six days, September 8th. So we had a bit of a trial run with the video log briefing, Esther. Uh, yeah. What was it, two days ago? Yes. It's, it's all one blur. This week's so busy. No, no. So <laughs> no, it was uh, well, yeah, yeah, Tuesday. Yeah, it was but, Tuesday. Yeah, so yes. three days ago, uh, mm. and it was a good. It's, you know, it's again good to get acquainted again with the uh, the hopping platform. So we mm. had it on the hopping platform. Worked like a charm. Everything was all right. Uh, today, just briefly talk about Transperfect uh, and Str uh, and NASA. So going to the moon. And also, we talk about jobs. Uh, our monthly jobs index continues to climb. But first, mm. are you aware of scanlation? Do you know what I'm scanlation not. What is? is? This? Okay, let me just try to break it down. Just <laughs> spend 30 seconds, one minute on this. So, mm. uh, scanlation are, um, it, it's fan translation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, of like uh, Korean uh, web comics. And apparently there's 1,300 scanlation aggregate websites that are active in more than 30 countries, according to the Korean Foundation for International Culture Exchange. Uh, there's, they, they published a report on that. So those scanlation sites, they host unlicensed and amateur translations of webcomics from Korea and other countries, but mostly Korea, maybe some Japan, in over 40 languages. And they generated like, I don't know, 300 billion, like half a trillion page views in 2020 alone. So I guess the, the monetization model here is you, you translate those um, or fan translate those mm -hmm. Uh, web comics, and then you know you uh, you sell some Google ads uh, alongside it uh, because you apparently get a ton of traffic for that. So that appears to be the business model. Um, but of course, it's essentially it's kind of uh, it's intellectual piracy, right? So uh, those uh, the publisher of the web comics want to get want to have a official translation. But it's interesting that this uh, fan translation trend or phenomenon, it's not even a trend, it's been around forever, mm -hmm. right? It's mostly centered around like gaming and like, uh, yeah, like kind of Korea, Japan related comics or or games. So yeah, we had that in our Slater um, um, sweep service, the week, uh, the daily update. I just wanted to bring it up. Scanlation, never mm -hmm. heard that term. I think it, the concept also exists in media localization, you know, in languages that aren't really served very well. Um, you get some sort of piracy sites and things like that where people upload their own subtitles and whatnot. Yeah. So, probably subtitles, not fan yeah. dubbing. That would be horrible. No, uh, yeah, <laughs> Maybe now. This is a bit much. <laughs> <laughs> With all those tools, you probably, you know, you could use some of those tools that we've been covering recently and do fan Very dubbing. Um, all right. So let's go to a uh, somewhat drier topic. So uh, the topic of financing TransPerfect, rather, uh, providing loans to TransPerfect. This is a consortium, consortium led by Bank of America um, uh, provided a refinancing for TransPerfect, a new term loan, a uh, quarter billion dollars, $150 million, and a revolving credit line, also a $250 
million dollars. This replaces a 2019 credit facility of 450 million dollars. That and that credit facility had in turn replaced another one that mm-hmm. um, you know co-founder Phil Shaw took out when they bought the company from fellow co-founder Liz Elting back in 2017, or at least the, the half that he didn't own at the time. So you know you don't have that uh, kind of money lying around uh, as spare change. So he uh, he got a I think at the time it was a fairly high interest loan to to conclude that deal, then replace it with a lower yielding uh, lower interest loan and now probably a very low interest uh, loan uh, as the company continues to be super profitable and and you know continues to grow. That's what the banks like. So they provided them a loan, and that means that uh, you know there's enough cash uh, there for doing. Maybe not more semantics, but definitely uh, a fair amount of uh, M and A that we would see, would expect from uh, from TransPerfect going forward. Um, yeah, and let's go to the moon. No, not go to the moon. What does <laughs> what does NASA do these days when uh, Elon Musk is sending rockets to space? I think they give him money, don't they? <laughs> they? They give him money to send rockets to space. All right. Yes. Well, and they are also giving money to Tech Trans International, uh, which is a translation company, language service provider. Um, so we covered news this week of NASA awarding a, a translation contact a contract to this LSP. Um, the contract is worth up to $59 million dollars. And that is over a maximum period of four years and nine months, which is a maximum of around 15, roughly sort of $15 million per year. Um, The contract is also just for an initial period of two years. So the remaining part of that four years, nine months is is kind of options that NASA can use to extend. Um, Well, a bit about the contract. It is called Russian Language and Logistics Services two uh, or rlls2 uh, this covers translation interpreting language training and international logistics and the service provided under the contract will support the space station operations both in russia and in kazakhstan so super kind of interesting and very very specific contract um, and do we equally, know Hmm. Uh, sorry, just jump in here. Do we know the the breakdown of like translation, interpreting, language training versus like whatever international logistics is? I don't think so. No. Okay. Sadly not. Um, but yeah, no, I was going to say that so TechTrans was actually set up to be dedicated to NASA. So <laughs> founded with the idea that they would be working with NASA. NASA. Um, back in 1993, um, they wanted to provide services for the International Space Station. Um, So that's what they've done. They have a headquarters in Austin, Texas, and they also have offices um, in locations including Russia, Jordan, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Kazakhstan, as well as Uzbekistan and Colombia. Um, So Hmm. not only providing language services, um, but TTI or TechTrans also offers aerospace, defense, global security, and uh, something which sounds somewhat unusual um, and a bit sort of well, definitely outside of the core of language services, uh, an experience which is called train like a cos, oh, I can't say this word, cosmonaut, uh, which takes place in Star City in Russia, which apparently is just outside of Moscow. And uh, el- the experience allows clients to stay at the Russian Space Agency's primary training center to meet Russian and American astronauts and to try their hand apparently at wilderness survival, spacesuit training, and negotiating a space station mock-up, whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds uh, that sounds great. So that sounds great. Of- Definitely not language services, but hey, it's uh, can we say it's adjacent? I guess so. Uh- <laughs> Let, let's explore the cosmonaut. Um, I don't know training market in in, in our yeah. next report. I was just, one one final thing on this contract before we move on. Um, so apparently it's it's the sort of uh, I, it seems like it might be sort of the, a renewal of um, one which is expiring at the end of September. So that one was a nine year contract for Russian language and logistics services that um, ends soon, and that one was covered uh, nine years. And nearly ninety million dollars. So I think it's probably related, especially given that you've got the two addendum. 
So the tension about who was going to win, it must have been absolutely unbearable. Maybe. I mean, it sounds like they might have been the incumbent. So, well, they, they, Probably. Tech Trans was working on that previous contract as well. As exactly. Said. So, I mean, yes. they were set up to dedicate. Are you being sarcastic? Yeah. I am being totally <laughs> sarcastic. Apologies. Ah, I snuck that it, in. Got it. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Cosmonaut, taikonaut, astronaut. Isn't that how it works? Like, I think the Chinese call it taikonaut, Americans mm. call it astronaut, Russians call it cosmonaut. Cool. So uh, there's probably more taikonauts in, in, in space right now. Who knows? Anyway, moving on to familiar shores with the mm. job index. Um, what's going on there? Yeah, well, Oops. all positive news still, uh, and it has been for several months now. Um, so the job in index, language industry job index that we put out every month um, is now out for September. And it has climbed again by more than 10 points uh, this month, up from 151 to about 161. Um, so, yeah, jumped by more than 10 points from the pre previous month. It is currently up around 53 points from the start of 2021 and also 61 points ahead of when the record started in July 2018. It's, um, yeah, all of the indicators that we look at pretty much are up, apart from two of them. Uh, we had a really notable increase in job ads on two of the platforms that we monitor. Um, and one of the platforms actually sort of doubled in terms of the numbers of, of job ads that they had from wow. August to September. So, yeah, a lot happening. Uh, so that's good for anybody who's graduating or is delivering their MA thesis or bachelor's uh, thesis, et cetera, right, from, from all this translation MA. So it uh, seems like there's a lot, of, a lot of demand in the market to absorb those graduates. All right. So that was a quick update. Um, it's been a super busy week. It's going to be another super busy week for Team Slater next week with SlaterCon Remote. But first, let's go to uh, Rebecca Petrus, again, spokesperson at Red Tea, and uh, discuss uh, the situation of war zone and conflict zone interpreters. See you Sounds in a bit. Good. Bye. And welcome back to uh, SlaterPod. Hi, Rebecca. It's great to have you on SlaterPod. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Hey, Rebecca. Welcome. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, thanks. thanks so, for having us. So Rebecca is a, the spokesperson for Red Tea, a nonprofit organization advocating for the protection of translators, interpreters in high risk settings. And of course, given the world events, uh, we, we thought it was great uh, to have you on and explain that situation uh, to us and, and generally the, the work that you do. Uh, but first, like, where does this podcast find you today in the world? Uh, I'm in Greece. Um... Uh, where I do a lot of my work. I have a, a, I'm based here for part of the year. Got it. Thanks. So, so Rebecca, you joined Red Tea after a, a long career in the language industry with Gala, Transit Without Borders, H2H Network, et cetera. But just tell us a bit more about your background and, you know, how you got into the space and also the humanitarian action space. Yeah, sure. I, my background is in journalism. Uh, and I went from journalism into communications and then into the language industry because I've always had a great interest in language and have a degree in German, uh, but I was never a translator. I got involved with Gala running the communications in 2007 and continued with Gala for about five years. In the meantime, uh, we had the Haiti earthquake in 2010 and that was when a number of folks in the language industry really recognized that the issue around language in the humanitarian sector was was not there. Um, in fact, it was it was completely absent, despite the need to really communicate well with people in crisis. So I got involved with um, Translators Without Borders and helped build it um, as a board member and then as a, a deputy director until 2019. Um, but during that time, I was very aware of Red Tea and Maya's work in Red Tea, uh, she's the founder, because the issue around protection of linguists is something that in the humanitarian space, of course, where we're dealing with um, conflict areas and, and, and humanitarian crises, 
there are so many issues around communications and linguists and there are translators and interpreters all the time and so I was quite aware of the red tea work and um and then you know when things sort of uh became very public in the last few months around the Afghanistan issue um I decided that I would uh, I would love to help and and get more involved with red tea I am no longer involved uh with TWB at all and I haven't been for a couple of years um been working in the humanitarian space in other ways and so it was a really good opportunity for me to sort of pull together some of my background and to see how I could assist Red T uh, as they try to advocate for protection of linguists um, in Afghanistan and also beyond. Well, so can you tell us a bit more about the background to Red T and what your role as spokesperson involves? For sure, yes. Um, so Red T was really came to Maya, the um, as I mentioned, Maya has the founder, back in the mid 2000s, 2005, when she was working as um, as a forensic linguist um, for in, in federal court and realized that, in, in fact, in a particular um, setting, realized that the issue around protection of linguists in high risk areas was was really critical and there was very little protection. And so this really gave her the idea to put together um, a dissertation to discuss that issue, to discuss how the um, uh, prosecution and the threats around linguists is is very real. Um, she wrote her dissertation and then in, in 2010, she established the nonprofit Red Tea to advocate for translators and interpreters. Yeah, it's it's an extremely important mission, and of course, over the past few weeks, it's been uh, it's been highlighted by the the really terrible situation in Afghanistan. So maybe we can we can talk about that. Like, what's the current situation, as far as you're aware, of of interpreters in Afghanistan, and like their evacuation or maybe lack thereof? Like, what are the most important things that are they're happening on the ground? As we know, the evacuation uh, ended this a few days ago. Uh, overall, many countries managed to evacuate a lot of Afghan nationals, um, maybe more than we anticipated. Um, and, in, and especially given how the exit and the evacuation was being um, planned and strategized. So it was, uh, there were a number of um, linguists who did, who did get out. Um, the actual tally numbers, you know, sort of like which country got how many out, that kind of thing. That's not really something that we focus on. And quite honestly, those numbers are not often not accurate. It's hard to get a proper number. Hmm. Um, the, you know, there is everything from 50, in terms of the U.S., you know, the special immigrant visa, which is um, the U.S. Uh, approach. You know, there, some say that there's 50% of those who got out were were SIV applicants, but then it, there are other numbers that are like 7%. So I think that there's a lot of confusion. Um, the most important thing is that it that there is a continued attempt to get people out who did not get out. Now, now you did mention that maybe there's not um, like a clear definition of like which country got who out but like in terms of just the people working with the country i would say that the predominant country would have been the, the u.s right were there other is that is the correct assumption and then like who else would be there australia the uk or can you speak to that uh, i mean that's a really interesting thing that actually a lot of linguists work for many different countries different employers so it could be a country it could be a contractor could be another at another instance a humanitarian organization so they have many different employers in fact um there's one one linguist who uh maya is uh communicating with and working on right now who has 11 different um employers so it, wow. it's it's really it isn't it is very extensive and it's hard to sort of go through and understand um, where, you know, 
for each one, like how to apply and what materials you need and how you prove it. Um, you know, the person you've worked for, maybe they're not with that, that organization or that country anymore, you know, that, that government anymore. So it's a very complicated process for many, many linguists, um, making it quite difficult for them. Uh, so, so I think that, yes, it's certainly true that um, the U.S. would be very high on the list of, of, um, of the amount of people who were employed by the U.S., uh, but I, do, I think there are so, so many more. Hmm. It's interesting. I mean, over here in the UK, I've heard all about it, obviously, on, on, on the news. And we've had individual members of the army sort of advocating for interpreters that they remember working with at the time. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a big job and it's a very personal job as well. But I mean, from your side, who is it exactly uh, who is working with these interpreters? Um, so is the armed forces, do they also assist other, other professions? The... You mean in terms of getting them out, um, there are lots and lots of different groups. And yes, I do think that uh, it's a number of organizations that involve, that include veterans and other mm. uh, folks in the military, wh whatever country it is. There are people who worked for NATO um, who are trying to help. Um, there are humanitarians. There's a whole group of, a whole another, another segment of people working to get um, journalists out who may have also been translators or interpreters. Um, so mm. it, it's, a, it's a mesh of organizations. There's a lot of, surprisingly, um, there's a lot of organization um, online between different groups to help and to try to make it, uh, you know, try to help each person. In terms of red tea, um, there's a lot of advocacy to um, direct countries, to um, ministers, um, to the UN. Uh, so we, we, our role really is around advocacy and, 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 and policy. So our, what we're trying to do is do open letters and try to really help um, make it clear and keep the, keep the issue out there, keep the issue on the table so that it's, you know, not just leaving the news and people understand that there are still an, an enormous amount of people who need help. Hmm. Yeah. I, and I imagine some of those advocating for them right now are also some of the same people that they worked with on the ground. Um, so, I mean, when you're thinking about the day to day of an interpreter on the ground in, in Afghanistan or elsewhere, who, who, what kind of professions are they working with on their day to day? Oh gosh, um, they work with humanitarian organizations. They work with journalists. Um, they work with uh, armed forces. Um, I mean, in many cases, they're playing the role of they're they're as a language person, as a, as a as a interpreter or a linguist. You also have a role in terms of interpreting culture and trying to help in that mm -hmm. regard. Um, there are uh, diplomats, um, business people, foreign corporations. There are so many. Basically, everyone who was involved, who was not Dari or Pashto speaking, um, was you know needing a needing a linguist. So it's a very wide. And a linguist may work for a number of different employers, um, either at the mm -hmm. same time or different times. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's interesting what you're saying about going into the kind of cultural advisory um, sort of space almost and, and working very closely with a lot of different professions. I mean, if what is the, the actual day to day, like the day in a life? If you wake up as an interpreter in the morning, you get up, where do you go? Who do you see? And uh, yeah, how does your day look? I mean, I think Maya likes to say that, you know, there is no day in the life of... <laughs> an interpreter, mm -hmm. especially in a high risk, high risk area or in a conflict zone in this case. Um, you know, it depends a lot on what the context is, um, what's happening that day. The, the interpreter must always be very aware. Um, they, you know, spend time just trying to, un trying to deal with the cultural issue of that day. Um, of course, each interpreter, each linguist is always trying to keep up their skills as well. There is jargon that changes um, depending, let's say, mm. depending on where you are in the 
in the country even. Um, so they're, they are often themselves trying to work through those issues around language. So um, yeah, I, I, I think if you were to talk to an interpreter, you, you would be shocked at how many different roles they play within one day. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, I think uh, when, when I spoke to Maya some time back, I think one of the key advocacy focuses is the lack of official status for interpreters, right? Like unlike journalists, for example, that may you know, have a, like a press on their back, et cetera. What what are the implications of that of that lack of official status and like what does Red T uh, Red T do to um, to change that? What, what would be the mechanisms to change that? Yes, that's correct. Um, there is a lack of protection for uh, for linguists, um, and I think compared to journalists, it's probably you know you, that would be a good comparison to see how there is a, more protection um, for the journalists. The main focus of Red Tea is to advocate um, at the UN, um, you know, on the behalf of the world language community. Red Tea organizes uh, events at the UN headquarters in New York uh, to to with with various missions to talk about protecting linguists. Um, they um, familiarize the member states with the problems that civilian linguists face that they are at risk um, of, of many different um, problems. Um, and we talk about the root causes, um, we explore potential protection mechanisms and look for fo um, collective action. So that's kind of our main focus. Um, in addition, you know, we have, a, a in the case of, of beyond the UN, we work with members of parliament within different countries to help change policy. Um, we try, we also work and do speaking arrangements and try to um, make people in, in various governmental and in intergovernmental bodies understand the issue around linguists. Um, we have also issued a conflict zone field guide to help learn how to be a linguist as well as to work with civilian linguists um, to help the employer. So those are a number of the areas that we focus on, um, the advocacy and the, um, the projects around the members' states. One thing I'm interested to, to think about um, and learn about really is, is who, who goes into, I mean, maybe a career or who, who becomes a, an interpreter in a war zone or a conflict zone and why are people motivated to do this, do you think? In, in a conflict zone, uh, you have, you know, people who um, have many different reasons why they get involved, just like, um, you know, journalists or writers and they, you know, they have many different types of work they do. That's true in the, in the conflict zone as well. Um, usually they are young men or women. Uh, they, you know, sometimes they're older, but they often have an advanced education. Uh, they may have a profession that has nothing to do with language, but they may not be able to practice that profession at the given time, given the issues around conflict. So in some cases, it may be an opportunity to uh, earn money to support their families when their other opportunities are not there. So you get many different types of people who get involved. Um, many have had experiences living abroad because that has helped them, of course, learn whatever language um, they need to interpret into. So, you know, or from, uh, which would be in many cases, say English or French. Um, they are, you know, often motivated by the idea of making a better place in their country. That is uh, one of the main motivations of interpreters who get involved working with the foreign uh, entity. They feel like maybe they can make a difference. So it's a, it's a broad uh, group of people. Uh, before we spoke about like who they they work for, and you, you said like there's a, a very broad range uh, of people, but like who recruits them in the first place? I mean, I understand. I, I would I would think that the role of military contractors would be a big one here. Or, or 
is, are they kind of one of the main recruiters of linguists in, in conflict zones? Because I, I would assume they don't work often directly or they weren't like employed or paid directly by, I don't know, the, the actual armed forces, but maybe go through contractors. Is that a correct assumption? I think it depends on the country. And I think there are many different countries uh, who contract with linguists in many different zones, war zones or conflict zones. And so it, you really have to, you can't generalize it too much. Um, certainly some countries contract with linguists directly. Others use uh, maybe a third country. So they work through another um, mission, another country. Others definitely do use military contractors. It may be the case, although I don't, I, I, I wouldn't generalize necessarily, but it certainly could be the case that those who've worked through a con, so linguists who's, who have worked through contractors uh, may have a, more hurdles when they are applying for a visa. This can be partly because the contractor may, the person, the actual person or the actual group that they were employed through um, within that contractor, maybe they're not there anymore. The, uh, they have to get HR letters, they have to get proof, um, and they may have trouble getting that from the contractor. So that makes it a little bit more difficult. Um, it seems like that's a, 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 a hurdle that they have needed to pass more than when they are working directly with a country. Hmm. And if we leave Afghanistan aside for a moment, are, are there any other sort of ongoing or emerging hotspots that you, you've identified at Red Tea? I don't know, Iraq or any areas that are concerning outside of the Middle East at all? Iraq is an ongoing spot of issue that we certainly look at and that uh, has a lot of interpreters involved. There are uh, issues in West Africa. You have uh, Mali, you have the Sahel region. Uh, then there's uh, definite evidence of issues around protection of linguists in Ethiopia. Uh, we've also seen persecution in Belarus. Uh, it, it, you know, it's something that where there is conflict and where the interpreter or the, or the linguist is playing such a key role of communication, that is where it often arises. It's, and it also, it's not just in conflict zones. Um, you know, it could be in, you know, a situation of, uh, a prison or, um, even in, a, you know, a linguist, um, who has a, provided language skills between an attorney and a, 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 guilt, a, a person who is um, being prosecuted. So there are all kinds of high risk areas. There's both the war mm -hmm. or conflict zone, but there are also really dangerous high risk areas in other settings as well. Um, maybe that, I'm trying to... Uh ask a, a question which I hope is not too complicated, but like the threat level um, it, and, and the perception of the interpreter as being party, uh, being a, uh, being partial, right? So, I mean, just let's assume in Afghanistan, like you, maybe the Taliban would have an interpreter and then they would be perceived as uh, working for the Taliban. And, but of course, now I understand that most interpreters would have, would have worked for, for uh, the armed forces there, the US, the UK, uh, how, how is that managed? I mean, is how does an interpreter, um, is the threat always very specific to the partiality of, the perceived partiality of the interpreter? And how do they work around that? I, I'm sorry, I can't make that question clear, but I hope I'm getting it across a little bit. Well, I think you, you hit upon something that is indeed um you know, uh, an issue and something, I mean, you, you've hit upon the complexity of the okay. issue that is something that, you know, where there is a, a trust issue on both sides and the translator or the interpreter sits in the middle of that. And so, you know, and, and there are situations where the role of the interpreter might be a dual role. It could be something where they, you know, 
maybe for protection, even they have to uh, carry a weapon. So there are a lot of very gray areas that make it difficult. Um, and so I think that, you know, the, the point being that if their main role is to help communicate ac across the various parties, that they deserve protection. And that's where we have to, um, we have to see that as such a vital role. Either you, certainly we understand that a journalist also can have conflict, can also have biases. And yet we think that their role is to be to protect it. And I think that that's something that the interpreter, that needs to be clear about interpreters as well. Hmm. Um, so, I mean, for those who are interested uh, in the language industry, of which I'm sure there will be many, um, do you have any information on how people can get involved to support Red Tea? Um, maybe just give us a rundown of some things that you're working on um, specifically right now that maybe people could help to support. Mm -hmm. we, we have a number of things that we are working on. I do want to mention the Open Letter Project, which is one of our main uh, projects. And it, it was a project where we created an international coalition, the historic first uh, to do so, where we have major language associations, academia, humanitarian partners who have come together and who support in letters uh, to governments or to intergovernmental agencies to implement change. And that's something that, you know, anyone who's involved in one of those associations or in academia uh, could learn more about. So that's something that we are quite involved in and have had some success in terms of our letter, our letters to, uh, to leaders. Then in addition to that, certainly um, just amplifying our message, following Red Tea on social media, uh, informing Red Tea of any knowledge of incidents of persecution. So when uh, someone learns about someone who has been um, affected or, or hurt in some way because of their role as a linguist, to let us know because we track those and we certainly follow up on them. Um, this is especially true in the non-English language press because we are a very small volunteer team and uh, we don't see everything. So we would absolutely welcome that kind of information coming in from anyone. Um, mm -hmm. Amplifying our message, really you know, continuing to put out there that protecting linguists is, linguists is critical. Uh, and we also have a UN pet petition um, that's called End the Targeting of Translators and Interpreters. It has about 50,000 signatures on it, and uh, mm -hmm. we would welcome um, more uh, signatures to that petition. That's a UN petition. Um, yeah. Yes, we'll... Uh... We'll definitely try to do uh, our, our very, very small part in, uh, in promoting the cause. It's a, a very valuable, uh, a very valuable cause, a very noble cause. And Rebecca, thank you so much for, for taking the time today. And uh, also, of course, thanks to uh, Maya Hess, uh, you know, the founder of Red Tea, for, for starting uh, this very valuable initiative. And uh, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll spread the word. And everybody who listens to this, please go to, uh, to Red Tea's website. Uh, we'll, we'll put it in the show notes. We'll put all the initiatives in the show notes. So uh, you can head there for more information. So thanks so much for joining us today, Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca. My pleasure. And thank thanks. you. Bye.